Wow, goosebumps. Goosebumps, you know, on, on some days I would say that there's no bettering what you just said and let's end the, let's end the podcast now. Um, but I have one more question, which I've been, which I need to ask you. Okay. Um, I remember the Challenger disaster. 1986, I was nine years old. I remember the images. I remember it. And it was, a, it, it, it's like, it stamped into my psyche, as I'm sure it's stamped into the psyche of many people who watched it. But for someone like you, that was intimately involved in it. How did that, how did that change you? So I'll preface my answer by saying that by that time in my career, and I was uh, 30 some years old, 30, I had just become an astronaut two years earlier. Um, I had seen an awful lot of death and destruction in the U.S. Navy. We lost seven pilots and seven accidents in seven months back in the late 70s, early 80s. And that was considered a successful cruise. But eventually we figured out in the Navy we had to do better. We had to develop the techniques of operating excellence to learn how to uh, not kill so many people. Um, I also had experienced, I, I have a theory, I don't know if this is right or wrong, but I have a theory that if you're a person who has experienced a lot of death and destruction and seen a lot, one accident will stand out more than others. And, and this particular accident that I experienced was, was not even someone who was close to me, but it affected me because this person died doing something that was not a very important mission. He was in a helicopter and they had an accident and he perished. It wasn't even a really close friend of mine. But it really caused me to think, do I really want to be in this business? And I spent three days wallowing in that self-analysis and discussion and why am I doing this? And, you know, it can result in senseless tragedy. But after three days, a friend of mine looked at me and he said, look, you just got to ask yourself one question. Do you want to be in this business or not? If you do, apply yourself. Become the best you can be. Don't worry about that accident decide this is what you want to do and get after it. And that kind of woke me up to the fact that, well, even though the accident was a tragedy and all accidents are tragedies, what can I do to prevent future ones? How can I improve my performance? Do I really want to do this? Yes, I do. And so once I, you know, went over that or through that emotional hurdle or whatever, um, it it became a matter of focusing on the task and not worrying about things that I don't have control of, which is the past, which is accident. So when when Challenger exploded, my my job down at the Cape that was the first launch I ever saw in person. My job was fulfilled at nine minutes before liftoff. Once they came out of the nine minute hold, I had no more responsibility. So I was able to walk outside the blockhouse and watch the, the vehicle climbing. But as soon as it came apart, my job then became to get the chief of the astronaut office driving back to the crew quarters to where the bosses were making decisions and sending people various places. So I didn't have the, <clears throat> the luxury or the ability to think about what must have been like for the crew, my job was to get the chief to the bosses. And I did that the best way I could. And we had a police escort and the guy was going 90 miles an hour down the highway. And there was a traffic jam up ahead. So he slowed down to 60. I was in a trailing rental car driving the chief of the office. And, and, and the police officer saw that he wasn't going to get through because there was a traffic jam. So he slowed down to 60, went into the grass and dirt median, grass and dirt and rocks and stuff flying by. And I followed him. And he entered the northbound lane heading southbound, where there were fewer cars going that way, picked it back up to 95 miles an hour. So now we had a situation where there's cars coming 55 miles an hour this way. So we had a closing velocity of 145 miles an hour. 
and and the cop is weaving in and out of this traffic and I'm driving the chief of the office to get to where the bosses are. And of course I stayed in the moment. What I learned that day was very helpful. It's not, it's, it, it, it's almost exactly like in Hollywood movies when you see the, the protagonist weaving in and out of traffic and everybody else, you know, and you're wondering how is he doing that? Well, it turns out people who are faced in that situation, the opposing drivers, typically their eyes get real big and they freeze. They stay in their lane. They don't maneuver. So we had the ability to maneuver in and out of them. Um, you know, and I got the chief to the, to the boss and, and the boss was making decisions and he directed me to go back into the helicopter out to the wreckage site and report what I saw. But the whole time I was doing that with the experience, the tragic experience of experience, so many other accidents was I, again, I stayed in the moment and I did my job and I didn't think about the crew. It isn't until much later, again, when you're trying to go to sleep that you have the ability to think about, oh man, what must it have been like for my seven friends who knew they had seconds to live in an impending tragedy? And, and that makes it really hard to sleep. But when you're awake and you're functioning, you do the job. And I watched, by the way, I'm finally getting to a maybe a point in this answer. Um, I watched bosses at NASA who did it really well. And I watched leaders who weren't as good and did, weren't making good decisions. And I remembered that 19 years later, when I became, was tasked with becoming the search director, the operational search director for the Columbia crew, uh, essentially no rules, unlimited budget, whether we go find your seven friends. And I was responsible for coordinating the, the effort of 45 different companies and 2000 people to go find the human remains of the Columbia crew. I remembered the experience from uh, years earlier, I watched good leaders and I watched not so good leaders and I knew what to do to effectively lead a team to go find the human remains and recover them with dignity, honor, and reverence. And all those words matter. And so we did that job and you stay in the moment. It, it isn't until you have the time to think about it when the reality of the situation hits, but, but when you're doing the job, you just stay focused and you, and you do the job the best you can. And, you know, my hope is someday in the next life, I'm able to see the Columbia crew and tell them we did the best we could. And, and thank them for inspiring the rest of us to continue the journey of exploration. So I'll give you three. So one of them I've already mentioned. Um, I had a client of mine that wanted to show off how powerful he was. And he wanted, he was heading into Florence and he wanted to have a phenomenal dining experience. Well, in Florence, you know, that you know, you got Tuscany around, you got so many ways of having a great experience that I wanted to amplify it. So I closed down the uh, the famous museum, the the Academia de Galleria, uh, that houses Michelangelo's David, set up a table of six at the feet of that, and then brought them in. They had the entire museum to themselves. They had a string quartet. Um, and while they were eating their pasta, I asked if I could bring in a local entertainer to serenade them during their meal. They said yes, and I walked in with Andrea Bocelli. So that's one of the things. Another one is a client came to me and said that he wanted to meet the rock band Journey. And Journey was just going back on a, on a retour. And I said, oh, what do you want to do? And he said, I'd love to go backstage and meet them after a concert. And I said to him, okay, so you, you, know, you want to just go and shake their hand and get a photo? Yeah, I do. And I said to him, why? And he explained to me, that through, uh, when he was at college, he earned his money by being the lead singer of a Journey cover band in the local bars. And as he's gone through life, you know, he made money, lost money, he was ill, he was uh, married, he was divorced. You know, the ups and downs of life. But at uh, all of those points in time, he listened to Journey to get him through to the next step. He would celebrate with Journey, commiserate with Journey, invigorate, inspire. It was always Journey. And he said, I just want to say thank you to him. And I said to him, well, hang on a minute. You're telling me that with Journey being the, the soundtrack to your movie, 
the climax of that movie is you're going to be walking backstage, shaking their hand. They're going to forget your name before they've hit that changing room. Let's give it a better climax. So what we did was we arranged that in San Diego, uh, live, in concert, they brought him up on stage, and he sang four tunes as the short-term lead singer of the rock band Journey in concert in what was at the time called, um, I think, the amp- uh, the Cricket Amphitheater. I think maybe the Verizon. It's changed sponsor name now, but in San Diego. So he lived his life as the lead singer of the actual band. So that gives you two. That gives you two things that, let's be blunt, took a little bit of cash. Okay, but your question was what changed me. So I had a client of mine that every year um, he would do something wonderful to celebrate his anniversary. He's drank champagne literally on a mound of diamonds. He's flown over to Paris for one night for a meal and then flown back the following day. He's uh, walked on rolling Broadway, you know, had the wife's name called out during a concert when they went to a concert with a favorite uh, singer. We've done all of these things from, and we've ranged from like 50,000 to half a mil for a weekend. Okay. So we're talking about money. And he contacted me because it was his 25th anniversary. And he said, I want to do something for my 25th. It's obviously an iconic one. It's 25. It's a quarter of a century. I want to do something that's fantastic, brilliant, and impactful. And it was that last word that I hooked on, impactful. You create impact by getting to the core of what the person feels, reacts, and triggers to. Okay? That's impact. Okay? If I show you a a 50-grand watch, and you don't care about watches, that's of no interest to you. But if you love watches and it's a 50 grand vintage watch, you're looking at something that you go, oh my God, I never thought I'd see that. You know, so I've got to get to what's important to you in order to be able to create that impact. So we spoke to him and asked about his history, how we found his wife, where they first met, all of this kind of thing. And what he did was he tried courting this girl for ages at college and she was given in the elbow. No, not doing it, not interested. And then one day what he did was he borrowed his parents' um, uh, picnic rug and he stuck it outside one of the classrooms where she would be coming out. He got a hamper, a boom box, and as she stepped out when class was over, hit the boom box, a bit of the old Alexander O'Neill came out, and he opened up the hamper, knocked off a bo- uh, the cork off a bottle of champagne, had a sandwich, pack of sandwiches there, and he went, care to join me? And it made himself such an ass in front of the entire college for this girl that she sat down and had a bad sandwich and a, a, a glass of cheap champagne. He actually got told off because he had champagne on the campus, okay? Mm-hmm. And so that was the whole how they first met. So we thought for 25 years, let's recreate it. Now, every year this girl had been, uh, uh, she understood that on her anniversary, something incredible was going to happen. So we sent her off in a limousine, just told her, be comfortable. You're going to need to stay calm. So she was in sweatpants, hadn't hadn't done her hair, hadn't done her uh, makeup, none of that. Now, every year she'd been made up photographs. We even had video footage so we could do a video afterwards of what they got up to. None of that was happening today. So the car went around, drove around for a while, and then pulled up at a public park. Under a tree, we had found old photographs of his parents' picnic rug and actually been able to source an exact color replica of that rug and the hamper. And here was the dumb thing. We had to buy three boom boxes to get one of them that worked. Okay. Had we not had to buy three, we'd have been a lot cheaper. It ain't expensive to do a picnic. Um, So we got this boom box. So as the car turns up, he's on this rug. He hits the boom box, opens up the hamper. She steps out of the car as he just knocks off the car. He went, care to join me? We had recreated what happened over 25 years prior. It was so impactful, so memorable. She remembered that first moment that he was willing to act like an idiot just to get her attention. She literally fell on her knees and was crying her eyes out. I was hiding behind a tree just to make sure everything was going on. 
And all of my team were all, all in the area as well. We had some of my team walking dogs in a circle so that no one could come anywhere near them because um, you can't block off an area of a, of a public park. So we had had to think about all these kind of things. We had certainly not thought that she was going to fall down on her knees crying. The, the car, the limo driver, I felt sorry for him because he had the door open and he was like, what do I do now? What do I do? And he had to kind of like try and help her up. She was gone. They literally had to run over, get her and escort her over to the carpet, over to the picnic rug. That whole thing cost $1,700. If we hadn't have had to have bought three bloody boom boxes, that would have been less than 500 bucks. Okay. But we created something based on impact, not created on invoice. So I think that's one of those ones that really changed me. To me, it takes it takes practice. It takes practice to be an empath and it takes practice on how you are going to take steps towards whatever journey you're going down in that moment that is uh, just too much, too much, just too much. Um, and how you are going to redirect or take a left turn um, out of it. And I, I, I know everyone can relate to the 20th year, 20 year anniversary of 9-11 as an emotional empath, I, I, I got, and, and uh, you know, other people that are not empaths probably also got completely entrenched and obsessed, um, especially those of us that are old enough to remember when that took place 20 years ago. But I've been just straight five nights of just complete immersion. Like I can't pull myself out of it. And it is almost that feeling like it deserves that attention and it deserves that mourning. And it obviously doesn't from a single random human in Irvine, California, like watching it's, 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 that's, it's, a, it, that's a ridiculous idea. But to me, that's where that, that impact comes in where you, you, um, and I've had to redirect and pull back and say no more because it's, because I'm in continual suffering and it lasts all night long through all of my dreams and everything that I'm, 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 I'm processing as I'm sleeping, it just, it, it embeds itself. That's, that's what an empath is, right? Like you literally take on an experience or a feeling um, of another. So I have found that it requires quite a bit of discipline and I'm not always that disciplined about it, but I, I, I try to really pay attention to if it is enlightening me or harming me. And by the fifth night of, of the 9-11 obsession, it was beginning to harm me. I wasn't being enlightened anymore. You know, I, I, I'd, I was, you know, you, they only caught so much footage. And so you're starting to watch the same horror over and over again. And I wasn't being enlightened anymore. I was definitely, um, definitely going down a, 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 you know, a spiral. So I, you know, took, use the discipline to redirect. But I'm not always, I'm not saying, oh, you know, so disciplined. I, 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 I'm not, sometimes I, I screw it up all the time, but it does take that. And you, and it's practice, right? Like discipline is, you need, is practice. It, it most certainly is. And, and, and how would you kind of, because clearly your empathy and your um, ability to feel and other people's ability to feel empathy is a superpower, right? I talk about this quite mm -hmm. often. But many people see it as a weakness, right? Oh. They'll, they'll see it as like, you know, I can't function in this world. How would you, you talked about discipline, but how would you get someone who has a sensitivity, who has kind of, you know, this, this intuition, this empathy that flows through them? How would you get them to utilize that as mm -hmm. a positive, as opposed to always being on their knees because they are so sensitive. Yeah, well, I think the first thing to note and make sure that we're clear about are there are there's five different types of empaths, and one of them is an emotional empath. And if you're an emotional empath, um, there's you know like a one through ten. You could be a one or you could be a ten. I'm like a seven, um, and but I was speaking with my cousin, who I'm quite close to, a couple nights ago. Her mom, my aunt, we've lost literally because she was such a severe emotional empath, 10 plus, 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 
that she literally couldn't function on planet earth. And, and my cousin told me for the very first time, I'd never heard this, that she remembers her mom saying, I, I just never got over nine 11. And she was in Columbia, South Carolina when it, when it happened, she wasn't there. Um, and then we watched her deteriorate as those years went by to where she couldn't leave the house and she just, she, she wasn't functioning. So, uh, there are, there are varying degrees. So I'm only going to speak from my, my emotional empath world at a seven, because I don't, I, I don't think we could have done anything different for my aunt, nor could she have possibly done anything for herself. I'm, I don't know. We miss her a lot, but for me, it's, it's all about using that superpower to take action. Like that, that's what makes me feel good instead of terrible all the time. I also practice the discipline in not watching uh, horrifying videos of, of animal suffering, right? I've seen them all. I'm definitely not um, at risk of starting to eat them again. Like that's not going to happen. And um, I felt much like the obsession with 9-11, I was feeling for a long time, like I, I had to keep watching them. Like, if they're going to suffer, I'm going to watch it. And it was, became very, very debilitating to where I wasn't able to take action. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. The animals are not sitting around with their scratch pad. Like, good job. You watched a 77th video. No, they need me to get off out there and fucking fight. So that that's an example of, of, of the discipline. Um, I haven't watched one since every once in a while they pop up on social media and I, it's the one second like shit scroll, but, um, that's been huge. Right. So I guess that's also self-protection. Yeah. Discipline and self-protection. Um, and, and hopefully the people listening specifically the empaths will be able to take what you just said specifically around the issue of discipline and disciplining themselves to not necessarily putting themselves in situations where their, their empath nature can easily be taken over by negativity, right? You, sometimes you have to do it. I'm sure in your line of work, you can't always protect yourself. And when you are mm -hmm. kind of like, maybe this is the wrong way of putting it, but attacked, and your empathy is coming under attack. You then find someone who you can talk to, find someone who you can share with, find someone right. who, you know, gets it, gets you, understands what you're going through. Uh, and I think that's a really important piece of the puzzle. You know, when I cycle out to John Groats, I had one pannier that was full of just paper things. So I had like an AA road lap, map, atlas, I had a camping guidebook. I had a the British Lonely Planet, which is massive, uh, and I had an actual book that I was reading, Wilbur Smith. Um, so the yeah, so that was one penny. I mean, that's all in your phone now. So you know, I, and I'm a super lightweight, ultra lightweight nerd now when it when it comes to try and break records. But I'm glad I got in early. So I did that in 2008. Uh, failed the round the world cycle. Uh, then went for the swim. Did the swim after the swim to complete the first ever length of Britain triathlon. I then ran. John O'Groats back down to Land's End. So I'm now still the only person in history to have done Land's End to John O'Groats uh, swim, cycle, and run. Um, I'm waiting for someone else. So Ross Edgley is the only other person who's done the swim. Uh, so he just needs to pull his finger out and do the cycle and the run. So Ross, if you're watching this, come on, mate, hurry up. <laughs> I want some I want some friends in my little niche club. <laughs> um, so, so after that then, I... Uh, where was I? I was finished the run and I was sort of thinking, right, I need to do another F. And because I love the, the triathlon, the concept of changing disciplines, I thought, well, why don't I try and break the world record for the world's longest triathlon? Uh, and actually there's a very interesting little roundabout on this whole story of mine, which we'll come to in a bit. But so the current record at the time was 3,500 miles a woman i think in mexico had done so i thought well, i'll do i'll do something longer and i looked at various records and i just loved britain you know i think this is such a good island best island in the world and i hadn't explored enough of it so i worked out a lap of britain is 4200 miles um and i divided that up into the same percentages as a, a sort of a standard ironman as it were uh so yeah that landed up being a 3500 mile bike ride which is 
pretty much the same as going across America, uh, straight into an 820 mile run, which is not far off running the length of Britain, and then finishing off with a 120 mile swim. Only 120 miles? What's wrong with <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, there was a twist on this one. It was fully <laughs> self supported, the whole thing, which meant cycling and running, everyone understands being self supported on that. You have panniers and a rucksack. But the swim meant I have to I had to drag this stupid raft that I built. And in the raft, it was sort of a hatch raft that was what it meant to be waterproof. It wasn't in the end. Um, and inside that was my tent, sleeping bag, casual clothing, food, water, just everything I needed to survive. I think it was a 17 day swim along the south coast in Britain. And I'd swim all day until the tide changed, go to shore, find a bush, camp up, get back out, swim again. And just repeat it uh, until I eventually finish finish that swim, which landed up being the longest um, self supported swim in history. Uh, because well, it turns out no one's really ever done a self a, like a proper self supported swim ever. There's an Italian guy who does sort of weekends, and, and he also drags a, a little raft type thing. Uh, but it really was sort of uncharted territory. The whole concept of swim packing, I think, is it's become a word for it. And even now it's, it's pretty niche to be fair. There's <laughs> hardly anyone that, that has done it um, because it's mainly pretty miserable. You know, all you, it's cold. You're just looking in the water and up at the sky. It's, you know, it's pretty, pretty soul destroying. So, um, so yeah, so that was, that was the, the furthest, which uh, took, well, that took 85 days. And that record just got broken yesterday by oh, a guy no. called Jonas Deichmann, who absolutely annihilated my record. <laughs> he went around the whole world. So he cycled to, I think he cycled to Beijing from, he's German. So he cycled to Beijing from Germany. Uh, he then ran across Mexico and then, sorry, he, sorry, he swam the Mediterranean. So he did 450 kilometer swim along the Mediterranean, then cycled to Beijing and then ran across Mexico and then finished the last cycle to add up the cycle mileage at the end back into to, to Germany, which is, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty insane. Uh, this is a question I have for you because really maybe you can answer it for me because I, I suffer from this. You go on these amazing adventures. You are at your peak. You're having peak experiences and then you come home. And everyone is just doing exactly the same thing they were doing before. But you are on a different level, right? How do you go from being in these peak moments to coming back into everyday life? <laughs> um, having young kids helps. <laughs> Puts you firmly in your place when sort of the day after you're this massive world record holder, you know, and all of a sudden you're out changing nappies and mowing the lawn and <laughs> doing like house chores. Um, at the beginning, you're right though. At the beginning, it was hard because my ego was involved. You know, the ego in me was like, look at me. Oh, I'm so important. I've done all these things. You know, why should I wash the dishes now? What inspired you? What was that moment, if there was a moment, where you chose to delve within? I don't, I don't think it was one moment, but it was understanding that as I put all my energy into external forces, I'm not happy. Like I'm not finding a deeper sense of peace and joy by the outside world. And coming to understand that the only way I'm going to create that is by establishing that within me, or I should say reconnecting to that within me, right? And I think that that's when people are drawn to go in when they start to see, I have this and I have that, I have that and this and blah, blah, blah. And none of that ultimately is creating this much deeper, much more profound sense of peace, and then also at the same time, understanding the moments I have felt most peaceful, most connected to love, most connected to joy were moments when I felt like I was in alignment with what I believe is the divine energy of source within me, this divine love that lives within me, this peace that lives within me. 
right? And so that's a call constantly to continue to return. Because also what it does is, is it allows me to show up for others in a different way. And so I'm able to have deeper connections with people who are outside of me when I feel more connected to what is within me, which is to say, the more love I feel for myself, the more I am naturally emitting love, the more I am naturally available to others through the energy of love. The more kindness I direct toward myself, the more automatic my kindness for other people becomes. You know, I really do believe everything starts from within, which isn't to say, because some people have a really hard time loving themselves and are really good at loving other people. So I don't believe that if you don't love yourself, you can't love others at all. I believe love is this abundant, wild energy and love isn't making a distinction. Oh, Leon is loving others right now. Now Leon is loving himself. It's like love is just love, love everyone as much as you can, right? You're going to serve yourself by love. At the same time, I do believe that the more love I generate toward myself, the more I have to give in general, you know, and, and, but I think, I think we, well, I'll ask you what I was going to say is I think many of us come to discover that what we're seeking is alive within us. Has that been your experience? Yeah. I mean, I remember a, a very powerful moment for me was 2001 many years ago 20 years ago actually nearly it was sometime in march 20 years ago uh i was uh, in nepal and i was traveling i was still working as a broker in london um and i went and i spent two weeks traveling around nepal um and i had these epif- epiphanies after epiphanies after epiphanies but the greatest epiphany i had i remember i was uh, at this hotel and i went out to the back big, beautiful backyard, which was basically the Himalayas, right? Um, And the sun was setting and I felt more connected than I had in my entire life, right? Maybe as a kid, I felt a little bit more connected, but the memory of being one with everything came back to me, right? And it was, let's call it my spiritual awakening. There were still many, many dark days to come. But in that moment, I felt deeply connected. Um, And it made me realize that what I was chasing wasn't going to give me that feeling of connection that I'd had on that mountaintop in Nepal. Um, And yes, there's nothing, and this is is my theory, there's nothing wrong with making money. There's nothing wrong with going out into the world and being successful and getting whatever you've always dreamt of in the materialistic world, right? Mm. But if you don't have those moments of experience of connection to everything, you ultimately will walk through your life disconnected. Does that make sense? It makes absolute sense. I think that's how most people walk through their lives. Hello everyone, it's Leon here, AKA the kindness guy. If you like my videos, which I hope you do, don't forget to press the subscribe button and also to ring the little bell so that the notifications notify you that I have a new video out in the world.